Order. Uh, the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions. The Minister of Culture, Arts and Leisure, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Mr. John Dallet. Question Dallet. Again, Question number one. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. The Department of the Environment and the NIEA hold responsibility and policy licensing for this matter, but are urgently considering this issue with input being provided by my officials and museums in advisory capacity. On the 2nd of July 2012, an assembly debate was held on the management of artifacts generated since the introduction of Plan and Policy Statement 6 in 1999. At that debate, Alex Atwood, who was then Environment Minister, gave a commitment to present an executive paper setting out the need for a strategic shift in resources, policy and law related to the protection of our heritage. And since then, officials from DOE, NIEA and museums and DECAL have sought to identify the full range of issues and possible solutions. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for a very positive answer. Would the Minister agree with me that every town and village has got its secrets. And Kilray, for example, its arrowheads and stone hatchets and things that came from the River Ban when it, when it was excavated. Would the Minister agree with me that there has to be a better way in which local communities can share their own heritage, their own past, and perhaps in doing so, uh, come to a better understanding of where we are today? Um, I certainly would agree with the member, and certainly in his own constituency, Mount Sandals is earmarked as one of the first settlements. Um, and certainly he will, I'm sure, agree with me that uh, the success of the broader hoard that was brought to Limavati is an example, albeit a, a treasure, that where you can bring uh, a treasure of, of such stature to a local facility in Limavati, then I'm looking forward to the process being concluded, and we actually ascertain what artifacts are there, what status to have. And indeed, you know, given the nature of some of the, the, the histories and heritages that we have in our surrounding towns and villages, and the members pointed out some, there's nothing to say that they cannot be brought to the local place, should it be an art gallery, a museum, a library or a school, and exhibited there, because that's what local people want to see. They want to see local, big government working locally as well. I call Mr. Cahillo Hashin. Uh, I've got a previous question. Could I ask the Minister, uh, would she be concerned that potentially some valuable materials and artefacts uh, could have been lost because of the storage and archiving system that has or has not been in place to date? I thank the member for his question, and I think, uh, in fairness to him, this is certainly something that's been brought to my attention in terms of concerns right across the board, both within the professional sector but both within the community sector as well. Um, I mean, the man uh, uh, I note that the member mentioned the word potential, and it's always there until we actually ascertain what we have. There are many collections that have been discovered by private companies uh, in the process of developing certain works. And the, when the findings of the joint working group come before the executive, which they will do in an executive paper, not only will they map out the process, they map out the way forward, and certainly the cost implicated in that, but once that happens, we, would, we will then be able to be engaged in a process that will very quickly ascertain what's there, what we have, um, and if there are occasions where certainly treasures or, or findings of significant importance have been uncovered, then we'll do our best to make sure that they're not lost, that they are preserved, and indeed, in response to uh, his colleague John Dallet, that they will be preserved and exhibited. And I call, uh, because Pat Ramsey isn't in this place, I call Sandra Overend. Question number three, please. My department in sport and I are working with a variety of cycling bodies, including local clubs, to ensure that a new generation of cyclists is the legacy of the Giro d'Italia. This activity is set out in the Giro Legacy Plan, which is led by NITB and includes contributions from key stakeholders. Sport and I continues to support Cycling Ulster as it takes forward a number of strategies to develop cycling here, and in particular its youth strategy, which is aimed to increase participation in cycling within local clubs, local communities and local schools. Sport and I are providing specific courses for local cycling clubs, which will see more leaders and coaches trained to promote cycling from grassroots, grassroots groups to high performance levels. 
The Giro Legacy Plan also includes a schools engagement programme, and Sport and I is working closely with schools to offer competitions and activities to promote the event and the benefits of cycling to ensure that we can maxi maximise the legacy outcomes. So, over end for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that response. I wonder, it would be good to get some uh, further detail of the work that's ongoing um, with the young people and trying to uh, get young people involved more, whether that's through schools or youth organisations. I wonder, could the Minister provide some specific information about what's happening in my own constituency of Mid Ulster? Well, I don't, I'm certainly happy to write the member in her own constituency, but I can give her some broad headlines and even through her own inquiries and her contacts with local schools, she can ascertain uh, how that impacts in the middle story. But for example, as I outlined, there has been work under, underway with Sport NI with some of the local schools, which looks at a youth strategy. It also looks at uh, Sport NI in, in conjunction with Cycle in Ireland, um, looking at performances, but also in relation to clubs and communities and schools. I mean, there's been some 71 schools involved um, who have been involved in uh, cycling opportunities, looking at designing banners, designing bags all around the and all around cy or cycling, um, and indeed have been involved in cycling charities. Um, and I know that, for example, in the Shanklin and Collin areas, we see Glendale Club uh, received £10,000 as a result of the World Police and Fire Games legacy to try and enhance and promote cycling within those areas. But as I said at the, at the start, I'm happy to write the member with specifics to her constituency. I call Mr. David Hildage. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And just to follow on from that, and it's good to hear of the, the coaching and the programmes and the projects that are involved. But, Minister, will it take us any closer to the much needed facilities we're seeing on? Well, the member will be maybe aware of his, his uh, participation in the CAL Committee, but certainly. Sport and I and Dee have been working very closely with Cycling Ulster and Cycling Ireland. And it is really important that you need to identify gaps in facilities, even though we know what they are in our constituencies at times, and probably at times we know them more acutely than some of the governing bodies. But certainly that work is well underway to look at gaps, to look at feasibility studies and business cases, more so in the preparation for Velodrome, but not exclusively that. And it's also about how we can work existing coaching programmes with emerging sports and cycling is one of those sports that not just is emerging but certainly growing. So I'm happy um, through the CAL committee but even through direct correspondence to keep the member up to date on that. But it's very, impor it's very important that we get, particularly at community level and grassroots level, gaps in facilities to encourage better participation. Mr. Mackay. I got a, a previous concord. A, a previous concord. I think in the, in the past three to four years, we already have seen uh, the new generation of cyclists coming through, uh, especially in a, in a sporting and a competitive sense. And in my own constituency of North Antrim, we have no fewer than seven uh, cycling clubs uh, at present, which wasn't the case five years ago. Can I, can I ask the minister, uh, in that context, uh, and given the increased competition within the cycling sport, uh, what? she could uh, tell the House uh, by ways of an update on the business case uh, for a velodrome, because a velodrome, velodrome uh, is not present on the entire island of Ireland uh, and would be a crucial uh, piece of infrastructure to try and develop uh, cyclists to more professional standing. Uh, I thank the member for supplementary. Uh, just I touched on it very briefly when I was uh, in answering David Hildage's question. I mean, we have been working very closely with Cycling in Ireland and Cycling Ulster, uh, both DECAL and through Sport NI. At this stage, we're looking at the governing body bringing forward the business case with, with support of officials for, from DECAL in relation to the velodrome. Um, I mean, cycling has uh, taken off quite well over the past couple of years, and the members' constituency is one example. But there are numerous clubs who have been not only looking at getting more people involved, but looking at elite performance. And certainly the business case for a velodrome didn't stack up a few years ago, but my understanding is that that has changed. The process has started. It is well underway. I need to find out when the uh, process has been completed exactly what the figures are. And if the numbers are there um, and if it's got the support of the governing bodies, then we need to take it forward in the future. But it's very, very early days. But just to give the members some good news that the process has started and it's very encouraging. Thank you. And I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question four. Thank the member for his question. 
In November 2013, I announced that I would be setting up a DECAL North West office in a company limited by guarantee to deliver City of Culture legacy programmes and activities. The North West office is now in place, and I met with the DFP Minister on the 31st of March to discuss my proposals for the North West. DECAL officials are pro progressing plans to set up a company subject to a funding bid been agreed by the Executive. But in the interim period, I have continued to support a number of legacy projects in collaboration with Derry City Council, with over £2 million being invested since January 2014 in projects such as Other Voices, the Walled City Tattoo, the iconic Armour Pram project. I have also allocated £2 million capital funding towards the Daisy Fleet and Showgrounds projects, which will con contribute to the regeneration of one of the most deprived areas in the city. And next month, I will be hosting an All-Ireland Creative Industries Conference in the city, which will highlight Derry as a regional driver for the creative industries. Thank you very much. I thank the Minister for that information. In her keynote legacy speech at the Gas Yard in London Derry in November last, uh, the Minister made reference to developing modern sports facilities, including complexes in Derry, uh, Dungiven and Coleraine. I would appreciate a knowledge of what these are and what the timeline is for their completion. Um, in terms, of, I mentioned the Foyle Valley Gateway, which is looking at the Daisy Freeze and Showgrounds, um, which is primarily around uh, sport within the city of Derry. There are also two and a half million pounds that has been identified for a new sports complex in conjunction with Don Given through the Mavadi Borough Council. One and a half million pounds with Coleraine for Coleraine Showgrounds. Um, and indeed some capital monies into boxing as well. Um, and needless to say that I have absolutely no doubt that Straban and other surrounding towns and villages will be coming forward. I'm sure the member will agree with me there has been an underinvestment in that area, geographical area for some time now. Uh, this is a good start but we're not done yet and we're making sure that we're putting money not only in collaboration and partnership with projects that have already started and underway but doing it on the basis of identified need that will ensure that when there's a couple of funders, cocktail funding or projects will happen, there's better economic sustainability and there's buy-in from as many people as possible from the community. Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware that for the year and a half before the City of Culture year, issues arose in London Derry to try and make sure that the, uh, the year was celebrated in an all-inclusive way, and that was dealt with fairly early on in, in the year, thankfully at, at some considerable length. But what steps is she taking now that the legacy is being built upon and the considerable public expense that quite rightly is going in to the legacy project? What steps is she going to take to ensure that that inclusivity is deepened and broadened right throughout not just London Derry but the entire North West? Well, I thank the member for his question and thank his support in terms of making sure there's investment, not just his constituency, but certainly broader, the broader North West. I mean, there has been a lot of work that has been underway. There has been a lot of mature discussions. A lot of people, despite some of the differences that are, that are there, they put their shoulders to the wheel and they move forward, and that's still continuing. I mean, even just at the weekend, was a pan-Celtic festival, um, not just in the city, but certainly I was in Dungiven, uh, for a sports element to that, but it's also around music, which involves a band's forum, it involves a walled city tattoo, it involves all the other people who participated in the FLA, um, and that's grown. Those conversations have happened, they're continuing and they're growing, and what we need to make sure is that all that good work and all that pain and all that maturity is not just sustained, but sustained for the now and sustained for the future. And certainly I'm encouraged by some of the uh, contributions from the political representatives from that area, not just to support the groups who are making these mature decisions for the here and now, but to support them in their journey to the future as well. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the, the Minister for her answers thus far. Can I just uh, ask her, she, she mentioned the £2 million for uh, the Daisy Field development, can I just ask when that's likely to be allocated and when we're likely to see uh, some work on the ground? Well, the member should be aware that that money has been allocated and we're working with the uh, um, Derry City Council and also with other partners, including ILEX and DSD, because, as the member will be aware, Foyle Valley Gateway is just more than one funder, and that's, that's the way it should be. Um, so our monies have been available. I bid for that in the October monitoring round of last year. Uh, the work, albeit preliminary, has started. I'm happy with the progress that's been made, um, and certainly in terms of what's needed for other facilities in, in that area for the future. 
uh, work has started already to try and secure funds, not only for the Brandywell Stadium, but for other projects in the city of Derry, to make sure that there is a loss in legacy from the city of culture. Thank you. And I call Ms. Michelle McElveen. Question 5, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In 2010, the Executive agreed that responsibility for events would transfer from DECAL to DETI. My department and its arms length bodies work very closely with DETI to bring internationally recognised sporting and cultural events here. With regard to sporting events, DECAL and Sport NI have key roles in the Giro d'Italia, the Big Start, which includes participation on the local steering committee, the activation committee and the groups dealing with the cycling legacy, promotion in schools and volunteering. Sport and I is also providing technical expertise to the race committee and my department is also working with Daddy and NITB and other key stakeholders to see how we can bring the Rugby World Cup to Ireland in 2023. With regard to cultural events, my department has engaged with NITB to secure events in the past such as 2012 Our Time Our Place, the City of Culture World Place and Fire, Fire Games and the forthcoming Games of Throne exhibition. And looking ahead, collaborative work between DECAL and DETI will continue, thus helping to ensure that we continue to benefit from hosting ma major and sport and cultural events here. Thank you. And the Minister has highlighted a number of events where the Department are, are minor partners, but last year we saw the success of the UK City of Culture and the World Police and Fire Games. And how um, this demonstrated that Northern Ireland does have the capacity to deliver key cultural and sporting events. To date, the lack of a DECAL-led strategy, strategy to attract similar scale um, events is clearly disappointing. And would the Minister not agree that this demonstrates perhaps a lack of innovation within her own department? Well, the Member will be aware that on her colleagues watch the events three reasons, well, which will be known to this Assembly fairly soon, had to be transferred. So poor governance and poor performance under DUP watch had to be transferred to another DUP Minister to mop up their mess. Now, what I have done, I have brought the City of Culture and World Peace and Fire Games in partnership with my executive colleagues. I am happy to do that and work in whatever role that I can in the future to make sure that we have events that we can all rightfully claim as ours. What I do not think is helpful is people scoring cheap political points over something that's, that you know is not beyond my control. But I am looking forward to seeing the result of the inquiry into what happened in the events and sharing it with not just a member for uh, the Chair of the Cal County, but certainly other members in this Assembly. Because I think we all need to learn what happened and what mistakes we can avoid for the future, and certainly what reputation that we need to hold to make sure that that doesn't put people off coming here for big events in the future. And you know, I think we're very lucky that we've got plenty of sport and cultural champions here that help attract people to our shores, and that's what we need to focus on rather than looking back. We need to look forward. I call Mr. Michael McJimsey. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I refer the Minister that not just are we looking for events coming in, uh, and that is all well to the good, and we have a number of notable successes in that, but we also have a number of events homegrown uh, that do so much uh, for our image. I am talking about things like, for example, North West 200, Ulster Grand Prix, and indeed the Milk Cup. And in reference to the Milk Cup, we are aware that it is described by Alex Ferguson as the finest youth soccer tournament anywhere in the world. It has challenges as far as its sponsorship is concerned. Could the Minister outline to us what steps she's taken, either individually or with colleagues, to ensure that this vital tournament gets the support it requires? Thank you. I thank the member for his question. Um, rather than waiting on one department passing the buck to another, I lifted the Milk Cup and Foy Cup last year and funded them directly from DECAL, simply because I totally agree with what the member said, irrespective of what Alex Ferguson and everybody else holds, although that's very, very important. That gives a status to a competition that has an international uh, status. It also has many children and young people who aspire to play on those pitches and to be part of that competition. And so to that end, rather than waiting someone coming back and make a decision at the last minute, I made an intervention and I've done it for both. And I'll do it again if I have to, because I think it's money well spent. Thank you. And I call Mr David McNary. Question six. I thank the member for his question. And as sponsor department for NI Screen, my department's role is to support the organisation to meet its business objectives across all of its activities. 
NI Screen does not in itself develop projects, but instead provides funding for a variety of film and television productions. Local extras for individual productions are supplied by an external agency, and according to the figures from that agency, almost 2,000 positions for extras from the north were created by NI Screen funded productions in 2012 and 2013, rising to over 3,000 in 2013 and 2014. In addition, a total of 246 extras from the south of Ireland were also employed during the same periods. The film extras have worked on a range of different productions, with the majority having appeared in large-scale productions such as Game of Thrones, Dracula Untold and The Fall. Mr. For supplementary. I'm grateful to the Minister for a comprehensive answer. I uh, must say, Deputy Principal speaking, looking around here at the moment, uh, I think we could do with some extras just to fill the empty spaces, which may make my, my supplementary a bit more interesting. Um, as the Minister said, the numbers, but I wonder, is she in a position to indicate what sort of pay rates a film extra could uh, expect to earn and how much additional money has been introduced uh, into the local economy through this type of employment? And if possible, are there any uh, specific examples she could uh, relate to? Um, well, in terms of the pay rates, I don't have that information, but I'm happy to raise it on the member's behalf. And, well, I, 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 I'm not sure, but I'm sure when we find out, out exactly what the pay rates are, then perhaps people can make a decision if they want to moonlight on their part-time, although really most of us shouldn't have any part-time at all if we're as busy as we say we are. In relation to you know, what it provides to the local economy, it's now getting into you know, somewhere in the region of £40 million to the local economy in terms of local film and television production. Uh, certainly not to be sniffed at by, by anyone, and it shows that we're the creative industries, not just in terms of the money that they're accruing through their own production, but they're actually providing employment for local people, not just in extras, but also in hospitality, accountancy, trades, um, and certainly you know, uh, in terms of hotels and B&Bs and guest houses, they have certainly benefited. I mean, as a member may be aware, even the Game of Thrones, as, just as, as an example, has travelled to a couple of different locations and there are four at times has invested in those local towns and villages. That's the sort of economy that we need to see growing. That's the local and small businesses that, de that depend on us to bring those opportunities. But happy to get the, the information to the, the, the member in relation to the pay scales. Mr. Fergal McKinney. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? And can I ask her what potential benefits will Northern Ireland Screen's Open Doors Fund bring to the local community? Well, the, the Open Doors um, Fund, as a member will know, has created a lot, of, uh, a lot of employment and certainly a lot of support to the local film and television industry. I mean, that's where I mean, the new the strategy, the Open Doors strategy, aims to make the screen industry in this, this part of the island. Um, where, for example, we're looking at high-end television and drama tax credits. Um, we're also looking at further incentives. We're looking at budgets. Um, and certainly um, showcasing certainly uh, sets and scenery uh, where other regions and other areas can't offer. I mean, the open door strategy isn't just about making this an attractive option in terms of marketing, but it's also about what we do in terms of our investment in those companies. As uh, NI Screen, so far, I mean, the strategy ends this year, are well, well on board with their targets, if not exceeding them, which is good news for us all. I call Mr. Leslie Green. Question number seven. Thank the member for his question. Um, I believe uh, Kelly Gallagher's gold medal success uh, in the Winter Paralympic Games in Sochi will inspire more people to get involved in sport, particularly women and certainly those with disabilities. Kelly was quick to acknowledge the support she received in Sport and I, in particular the Sports Institute, um, in both her preparations and certainly that support at the events. My department strategy for sport is aiming for a 6% increase in participation rates amongst people with a disability by 2019. There are indications that we're making good progress towards meeting that target, but to help achieve it, we need to work with other departments and councils and sporting bodies. Disability Sports NI has outlined to me their plans to maximise the legacy of the Olympic and Paralympic Games 
and the plan suggests a new disability active partnership across local authorities and departments. I have written to my executive colleagues to explore opportunities for interdepartmental support, including funding to take forward the DSNI proposals. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her reply. Minister, uh, obviously you, you do share uh, my view that the inspiration of Kelly and indeed our Paralympians in London really do need to have a legacy that we can build upon, and I'm glad to hear that you have started. But um, obviously for that legacy to be developed, uh, we need immediate plans. You've mentioned uh, one sort of partnership. Are there any other specific plans in place now to develop this issue? Well, certainly I met with a disability sport NI in February. I have regular meetings with them as a member will maybe be aware. And they have looked at the, the targets that have been identified in the Sports Matters Strategy and brought additional targets. As I mentioned in the, the primary question, I've written to other executive colleagues and I aim to follow those up with meetings. So it's not just writing to tick a box. I'm going to follow it up with a meeting. I'm going to be very proactive. I know that Sport and I have been very, very proactive also, particularly looking at the role of the Sports Institute. Um, and not just working with um, some of the governing bodies around disability, but working with some of the youth clubs and the schools as well. I mean, our Active Aid programme um, and other programmes that, that resulted from the Olympics and the Paralympic Games, and indeed even from last year, the World Police and Fire Games, are all going to be brought into that. So just to assure the member, I'm not going to be sitting, resting on this one. I'm going to try and push it forward to get the maximum possible, because these people not only deserve our, our support, it's our duty to make sure that they have it. Commissioner Oliver McMullen. I've been asking Cody and can I thank the Minister for her answer so far. But can the Minister tell us what other actions are taking place to improve participation in sport amongst those with disabilities and special needs? Thank the member for his question um, and certainly not to sound repetitive from the last question but just to even maybe elaborate. I mean, the Active Communities Programme and Awards for Sports Programme and other programmes that were there from the Paralympic and Olympic Games in 2012 are being brought forward. The Sports Forum and the Disability Sports Forum have came to us in a very proactive way to try and raise the profile of disability sport and certainly we have done that not only in the department but certainly worked with some of the governing bodies. District councils have been very good uh, and with the encouragement and support of their chief officers have been involved in the Active Communities Programmes. Um, and certainly looking at countryside access and activities to make sure that you know, those with disabilities and special needs and working with the schools to make sure that they aren't not missing out on opportunities to participate in sport. So as I said to the, um, Mr Cree that I will not just write to each of the departments, I follow up on meetings and persist until we get a better joined up way of working with a group of people who up until now feel that they haven't received the investment support that they're entitled to. I call Bradley. Thank the member for his question. Uh, the Irish language strategy has been revised and strengthened following a comprehensive public consultation exercise and has also been informed by engagement with other executive ministers. The crucial role of the Irish language stakeholders and community has been more fully reflective in the strategy. And the strategy sets out a framework for the next 20 years in areas such as public services, education, the home, community, the media, economic life, to enhance, protect and develop the Irish language. A strategy delivery group will progress the strategy by agreeing detailed action plans with each department. And in line with the 2011-2015 programme for government, my intention is to shortly publish a strategy to enhance and protect the development of the Irish language and a strategy to enhance and develop the Ulster Scots language, heritage and culture. I call Mr Bradley for supplement. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Can I ask her, can she be more precise about the publication date of the strategy? Well, I haven't got a date here, um, but can I assure the member that I intend to do this before the summer recess commences, as they will, I'm sure, appreciate and still waiting on some responses. 
back from departments, but if the departments don't respond by a certain time, I'm going to publish it anyway. And I think um, certainly <clears throat> both strategies. There's been a lot of work put into both strategies, both Ulster Scots Agency and indeed many, many groups within the Irish language sector have taken it a lot of time to respond back to the consultation. That, in my view, that consultation is all the better for those responses. So in fairness to them, I think, you know, to give excited colleagues time to respond, and if they don't, I'm going to publish it before the summer recess. Order. Um, that brings us to the end uh, for the period for oral questions, and we will now move on to topical questions. And I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister and the Executive have constantly talked about stimulating our economy by promoting the creative industry and, uh, um, and uh, tourism and promoting tourism. Yet, the Northern Ireland National Museum have seen a £6.6 .6 million uh, reduction in their expenditure uh, over the last few years. And I understand they have also seen a drop of 200,000 visits last year to the National Museum. So can I ask the Minister, has she talked to other relevant ministers to see how we can have a strategic approach in promoting our museums in Northern Ireland? Well, I, th I thank the member for a question, and I'm not too sure where she received her facts, but they're wrong. Um, just in fairness to the member, I think she needs to go back because whatever information she has given, she has been given the full picture. But what I, what I will give the member the assurance that I go and check the information she has asked me for and give it back to her. But let me say this, both museums, sports and arts received a slight reduction in their budget in order to keep libraries open. And that's something that I was happy to do. Uh, and it was something to make sure that not only did the library stay open, but people, particularly living in rural areas, and from deprived communities had the opportunity to avail of their libraries. And museums received, even within that, an uplift on their budget and have told me that the numbers have increased. So I'm concerned what the member has said um, in relation to the numbers dropping. Ms. Anna Lowe for supplementary. I thank the Minister uh, for her answer. Uh, the 200,000 drop was told to me by uh, the, the Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Museum and uh, I had a meeting with him just about two or three weeks ago. So I think these are up-to-date figures and, and I think we all should be concerned about the drop. Uh, particularly, this is the year we mark the 50th anniversary of the Austerfolk and, uh, Folk and Transport Museum. Did we have a um, question, please? Yes, yes. Uh, the question <laughs> is, uh, would we, they, they are mounting in relation to this, the Austerfolk Museum, going to have massive uh, programme on promoting this anniversary. Uh, is the minister going to attend? Is the minister going to help with funding for the various programmes? Well, the member will be aware that I have and will continue to visit all the different um, branches of the museum, including the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum. Um, I'm, I appreciate the member clarifying where she received the information from, which is quite helpful. Um, I'll be able to go back to museums and uh, chase that up um, and understand that museums uh, and arts and all the members of the DECAL family have a lot and have a role to play in terms of promoting tourism. Um, and not only promoting tourism, but certainly decade of centenaries and many, many other opportunities that we have, particularly with our ongoing uh, programmes around reconciliation. Uh, it is vital that we have good public services to help assist those processes. But again, as I said to the member's primary question, I'll write to her with that information. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll Mr. Cahill of Housing. Uh, I've got the brief last question, Corolla. Uh, can the Minister confirm that uh, Gail Scona can provide an effective collaboration uh, with Altrim in the North? And have there been any discussion with both groups uh, in respect of a possible merger? Corolla Mabud. Well, the Member will be aware that uh, the new core fund arrangements, um, as they will commence on the 1st of July this year, up until this morning, and I ask this on a daily basis, Altrim have so far refused to engage with, with Gail Scullina around any potential mergers. I am concerned about this. I am concerned about the staff who are working in the organisation, and I am concerned about the duty occurred to those staff and indeed the work to ensure that the skills and expertise, particularly in early years, is protected. 
Mr. Hoshin for a supplementary. Uh, Mr. the previous question is going to be based on IRA, uh, so to uh, Can I say to uh, the Minister that I am shocked to learn that Altrim have not engaged uh, in any discussions on the way forward, uh, but that notwithstanding, uh, can she assure us that the door still remains open uh, for any discussion of a possible merger? I mean, just to assure the member and other members in this House, the door is open. The door will remain firmly open because we believe that, particularly I mean, around early years intervention, which is key to a child's development and education, uh, that the support is there. And Altrim um, have a duty of care, not just to their staff, but all the other services who rely on their excellent expertise and their support. So the door is open, and I would encourage them to walk through that door. Thank you, Mr. Chris Hazard. Um, can I ask the Minister to, to outline what discussions her department have had with NI Water regarding Port of Reservoir, please? Um, the, in response to the member and other members who have written to me around this issue, um, we have had ongoing discussions with Port of Reservoir and indeed with NI Water uh, about trying to keep the reservoir open. They did have to under, undergo major works last year to repair the reservoir. And as a result of that, I wasn't able to stock a popular angling, the popular angling in that area. But certainly the discussions are they're ongoing and they will be concluded fairly soon regarding restocking the reservoir once the work has been completed. Sir, sorry, I can't hear. Far too much noise from my right on the back Mr. Speaker. Listen to the questions and listen to the answers. I thank the Minister for answer thus far. Um, given that NI Waters' refusal to extend the lease for fishing rights to decal, uh, can she outline what NI Waters' plans are for the future? Well, it is regrettable that um, NI Water have refused to give a longer lease to decal in order to prepare the, the waterway for England, which is very, very popular in that area, and not just in that area, but other people visit in that area for opportunities. So we will be still having ongoing discussions with NI Water ar around the reservoir, and so far we have been told that the lease will only be extended on an annual basis and not on a five-year basis as it was previously. But to assure the member, I will continue with those discussions until they're concluded. But because the, the state is within decal, there's very little I can do um, other than what I'm doing at the minute. You, and I call Ms. Katrina Ruan. Gurumagat, the previous Concordia. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I wonder, could the minister outline why the 2013 budgets have not been signed off by her? Um, the tw 2013 budgets for the language bodies. Um, I'm assuming the 2013 budgets for the language bodies for the Irish language and the Ulster Scots haven't been signed off because I am refusing to implement cuts. Uh, the Irish government are insisting an additional 5% on top of what they asked both finance departments to agree, which would result in almost a 10%. And I'm refusing to do that. So the, from 2013 and even this year for 2014, all the bodies. Uh, namely the Ulster Scots Agency and Forshna Gaelga have received an indicative budget. It's regrettable that's the position, but I'm not, I'm not in, installing cuts either on behalf of the Irish Government or anybody else to two bodies who do very valuable work. Trian for supplementary. I'd like to thank the Minister for that response. And I wonder, I commend her for the action that she's taken, and I'd ask that she continue um, to desist and, and ensure that uh, the Irish language and the language body are not cut and that she will continue to liaise with the Irish Government? Uh, well, I will continue to liaise with the Irish Government. I intend to raise this before the full uh, North South Ministerial Council meeting, and I intend to raise it at that meeting as well if the previous discussions are concluded. But just to assure the member and other members who have an interest in this, I will not agree to cuts to Forshna Gilga and I will not agree to cuts to the Ulster Scots Agency. I didn't do it in 2013, and I'm not going to do it in 2014, or 2015, or 2016. And I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, it's nice to speak to the Minister again. She actually has touched on the question that I uh, want to ask, but mine's more broad in its um, approach. Minister, can you give us details of the nature of the contract between 
your department and the Department for Regional Development, uh, which actually deals with the use of reservoirs by anglers? Uh, well, I have no details of the actual contract, other than it's a leasing arrangement, but I have no details of the actual lease or the wording of the lease. But I think the member and other members have raised this on the basis that wherever angling occurs within that constituency, it's very, very popular and it's a sport that many people have been involved in and many people continue to engage in across generations. <clears throat> And I will have ongoing discussions, not just with DRD, although this is with NI Water rather than with DRD, to have those lease arrangements concluded, not just for Port of but other reservoirs that may be affected. Mr. for supplementary. I thank the Minister for that. Minister, uh, bearing in mind that uh, many of these reservoirs are not in use and, in fact, may be sold off, um, do you see that having any direct effect on angling and the issue of permits by your department? Well, not every reservoir has fishing rights, so for those who have, who aren't certainly up for sale or aren't up for renewal of lease, or that we don't stock, really, there, there could be many out there that I'm unaware of. I'm only dealing with the ones that I'm currently getting into a lease or contractual agreement with them, stocking the, those reservoirs with fish, working with the angling clubs, sometimes the local councils and other community stakeholders. But to assure the member, Angling has one of those sports that has grown in popularity over years for people with disabilities, for people of all abilities, uh, intergenerational, and it's a good example where you can put a small investment on an interdepartmental basis with other councils and other communities to make sure that you have a good legacy for sport and physical activity. So I'm really keen to ensure that what we have we hold and certainly try to increase and advance future potential and future opportunities. Thank you. And I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much. Would the Minister join with me in congratulating Cliftonville Football Club on an historic first ever back to back uh, league title success and David Jeffrey on a phenomenally successful career as Linfield manager? Absolutely. Um, I mean, David Jeffrey has given uh, a, a lifetime to sport. Uh, I released a statement congratulating David on his achievements and have written to him as well just to thank him for his personal contribution to sport. Uh, Cliftonville, back to back, two years in a row, my local team and my local constituency, I think they've done very, very well. And again, you know, when you see uh, sport of this nature on television, you see young girls and young lads out kicking footballs, jumpers on the ground, people getting involved in soccer, that's a good thing. That's a good side of Irish League football that I think we need to do more of and certainly celebrate more of, particularly in this house. Mr Nesbitt for his complimentary supplementary. <laughs> Let me think about that, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I thank the Minister. Does she have any plans uh, to host a reception, uh, perhaps jointly for Cliftonville and David Jeffrey and Linfield here at Stormont? Well, I've certainly written to David Jeffrey, and I would like to have a meeting with him, um, just to actually thank him for what he's done for sport. Uh, you're about the third person today. Between yesterday and today, he's asking about a reception, so I'm certainly looking at opportunities to hold another reception for Cliftonville Football Club. But I don't want the member or anybody else to think that um, certainly the contribution that David Jeffries has made to sport needs to be recognised, and certainly the contribution the Cliftonville Football Club, including all the staff and everybody involved, needs to be recognised as well. And everybody needs to have an opportunity to get involved in that too. Mr. Hey, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister what discussions he's had with the Finance Minister to release the £36.2 million for our League clubs to upgrade their grounds? Well, the discussions I've had with the Finance Minister have been primarily around looking at the regional stadium development, but he's certainly well aware that once we get Limf Limf not Limf Windsor Park um, up and underway, we will have an opportunity to start a sub-regional. I have the skills and the capability within DECAL, DECAL so there's a seamless link for that. But certainly once we get Windsor Park and Caseman Park up and running, Sub-regional for football is the next step, and then sub-regional for Gilly Games and for rugby soon after that. So the discussions we'll have with Finance Minister are just in keeping with the budgets for this mandate, but certainly flagging up potential for the next mandate. I call Mr Easton for supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer. Um, would the Minister agree with me the sooner we can get that money down to local clubs such as Bangor Football Club, who came second in uh, Championship 1? Uh, at the weekend, uh, the sooner we can upgrade their, their grounds and uh, encourage more people to watch the matches? 
Well, certainly the sooner we get this original programme started, the better. I certainly couldn't comment on facilities for Bangor, but just to take this opportunity to wish them well. Uh, time is up.